Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming for today's uh, book talk. Uh, I'm Jim Cheng, director of the CV Star East Asian Library at Columbia. And I would like to uh, first introduce our uh, guest speakers. Dari Yip. Dari Yip is the author of The King of the Chinese, From Baba to Banker, The Story of Yi Chong Yi and the Street Chinese. She has spent most of her career in finance industry, working as a banking analyst for various financial industry institutions before joining her family business investment holding company. She comes from a family of bankers. Her first book, The Kings of Chinese, tells the story of the straight British Chinese immigrants told through the life of her great grandfather, Yip Cho Yi. Uh, today's talk is about her second book. It's Eagles is her second book and uh, right there. Okay. And the second I want to introduce our today's discussant, Professor uh, Lian Hong Nyam. And uh, Professor Nyam holds the Dorothy Book Chair in the history of the United States and East Asia, director of the Weatherhead East Asian Institutes, and the co founder of the Vietnamese Studies at Columbia University. She is the author of the Hanoi War, the international, an international history of the war for peace and the general, and she is also general editor of the Cambridge History of the Vietnam War. Volume three, and she's currently working on the comprehensive history of the 1968 Tet Offensive. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn the mic to the uh, okay. Miss Yip. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all for coming. So I come from uh, Penang. Penang is an island uh, north of Malaysia. Uh, about five times the size of Manhattan, but with half the population. Um, Penang was the first British colony. Can you hear me? So Penang was the first... Is it working? Okay. Uh, so Penang was the first British colony in Southeast Asia. And um, before tourist arrivals, it was the second most preferred destination uh, for Chinese migrants, those that were that came as contract workers, coolies during the second wave of the Chinese diaspora. So about 15 years ago, I wrote my first book, uh, King's Chinese, uh, about these Chinese migrants, but told through the life of my great grandfather who himself was a, a migrant. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry, we forgot to sh turn on the slide. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so then... Yeah, so 15 years ago, I wrote about the book, got it published after 11 years. But during the course of my research, I found uh, that there was a lot of uh, information lacking about women, that if they were to appear in the news, they would be called, they would be referred to as Mrs. So-and-so and rather than their first name. So then I came across another term, farm cova which basically means that if you're uh, a, a married woman, your all your rights and your obligations will be merged into that of your husband. So basically you cease to exist. That was then. So you, can't, you cannot make a will, you cannot own your own property under your own name. Uh, you, cannot, uh, um, you cannot enter into a contract. So that basically gave me an idea, started, me thinking about writing a book about women. So about five years ago, I met Lovey Tanner, the last living daughter of Oi Kyung Ham. Uh, he was the sugar king of Java and the richest man in Asia at the turn of the 20th century. I got talking to the daughter-in-law and we came up with this idea of writing about the three Oi women. So we have Lucy Ho, who was the seventh wife 
of Oi Tiong Ham, uh, Oi Hoi Lan, who is the second daughter from the first wife of um, Oi Tiong Ham, and Ida Oi, who was the uh, second daughter from the fifth wife, who was also married to my grandfather. So when they were when they were growing up, uh, the world they were they grew up in, at the crossroads of two very contrasting worlds. On the one hand, they came from a culture that was steeped in traditions where we were, women were subordinates of men, uh, living under very strict uh, societal norms. And then on the other hand, they were born uh, in the Dutch East Indies, a colony that was controlled by the West. At that time, uh, the West uh, was going through the second industrial revolution became extremely rich and um, with wealth that was technological uh, innovations and um, people were obsessed with everything new and modern, but it also affected the way they saw the world. So to modern eyes, they viewed industrialization as a progress, as an advancement on humanity and uh, they, whereas less developed countries would be seen as primitive and backwards. So they took advantage of this modernity to push forth colonial expansion. And they did it so well that by the turn of the 20th century, 85% of the earth were occupied by the colonial powers and its colonies. So on that note, I just want to introduce you to the women now. So this is Lucy. Lucy was the seventh wife of Oi Tiong Ham. She was dutiful, came from good background, morally impeccable, and uh, but very different from the other wives in the sense that she was uh, she had an education. She was very well educated, quite rare for a woman of her era. She was about sixteen when Tiong Ham took her as wife. He was fifty, uh, and she gave him four sons and a daughter. But in 1924, after his death, and at the age of 23, she suddenly was hurled into the male-dominated world of estate management. She, at 23 years old, was managing half of Asia's richest estate. It's quite a feat for a 23-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, she was not only the mother, but father to the children, and then later on became the matriarch of the Oi family, as well as her own family, the whole family. The next, the second protagonist is Ida. So Ida is quite special. Ida comes from, uh, the mother was the fifth wife of Oi Tiong Ham. The aunt was the third wife, and the grandmother was the second wife of Oi Tiong Ham. Uh, she was what we call a modern girl because <clears throat> I added her in because she came from a different generation from the other two um, ladies. She was born during, I mean, she grew up during the flapper age. Intelligent, vivacious, a free spirit, never settling down in a stable position. Uh, she did always did what she pleased. And she was also the youngest to inherit from uh, Tiong Ham's estate, making her a very rich modern girl. Uh, but then something happened to her when she was 10 years old. This picture, so this is, oh, oh sorry. Not so, sorry. This is her and this is um, my grandfather. This was her when she was 10 and this was him when she was he was nine this was Yap Choi Yi my great grandfather this was my great grandmother and this was Ida's older sister Noos Noos was married to Kim Ho my grandfather's half brother so basically two sisters from the Oi family married two brothers from the Yap family so at the age of 10, the, uh, sorry, at the age of 10, that's little Ida, she was already matched 
with my uh, with this boy who was nine. But then they got married like when they were in their twenties. <laughs> so this picture is interesting. This is Ida and her best friend in Sing Singapore, who later became her sister-in-law. And you can see here is a picture of two modern girls with two traditional women. So this is Ida's mother. She was from uh, Tamaram. This was uh, Chichi, the, the best friend's mother. You can see that she Chichi was bound to it. So this is a very interesting photo. Two, a photo of two modern girls and two, two ladies from um, traditional ladies. So that's the second protagonist. So the the third protagonist is um, Oi Hui Lan, otherwise known as Madam Wellington Ku. She was the most celebrated Chinese woman of her era and the most famous daughter of Oi Tiong Ham. Uh, Hui Lan, when she grew up, she had a very rare European upbringing. She could speak multiple languages, European languages, uh, did many firsts. Vogue magazine hailed her as citizens of the world. Uh, another newspaper called her Western to the Fingertips. Uh, and um, yeah, she achieved many firsts, including flying a plane in 1919, marrying an Englishman in, the, uh, in 1916 during the height of the eugenics movement. Very brave thing to do. Then in 1920, she married the famed Chinese diplomat Wellington Ku. Oops. Yeah, seen in this photo. And uh, together, they aided China's cause to abolish the unequal treaties. So what makes them special? The three basically broke uh, from the past, challenged conventional views of what a woman is expected to do. Uh, but they, more importantly, they pioneered a concept which we all take for granted today, which is basically having a choice, a choice to take on a role other than what is expected of a woman. They had more power in re relationships, uh, more say, more equal opportunity, much to the frustration of the men in their lives. But today's talk, I will not go through uh, the, the adventures and the drama they created from the choices they make. But what I want to focus on is basically the early years and the people and events that shaped their lives. So... So this is where the story begins. In this place called Samarang, which is basically a, a trading town in the Dutch East Indies. Uh, three interesting facts about the Dutch East Indies. First, it was the most important colony for the Dutch. Um, it brought in about more than a third of revenue to the Dutch crown. Second point, in the late 19th uh, century, there were about 20 million people living in the Dutch East Indies, of which 1% were made up of the Chinese who controlled 40%, roughly 40% of the real estate in the colony and contributed about the same amount in terms of personal taxes. So although they were a tiny portion, percentage of the population, they had a very impact on the colony. And the third very interesting fact about the Dutch East Indies, which some of you may know, is that in 1667, something, a trade happened between the British and the Dutch. Does anyone know what that was? So the British, do you know? Do you, do you know? It involves New York. Yes, that's right where we are standing right now. So the British traded um, a tiny island somewhere around here, somewhere around here, you can't, it's so small you can't see it, tiny, tiny, tiny island uh, with the British. The British traded that island uh, with the Dutch for Manhattan in 1667 so that they could control this thing. 
hang on. This little thing. Do you know what that is? Yes, spice, nutmeg. So this this was so this was basically nutmeg was the was more expensive than gold. It this little thing could cost in today's valuation four to five hundred US dollars. So I brought one each. For all of you, you can take more. So my able assistant here will hand them up for you. Take one. You you have to crack open the outer shell and then shave. Yeah. So this one came from Zang. So the Dutch, they were controlling that trade. And then when the British took over the Dutch East Indies, they stole the seeds and planted them in Penang in India and all that. So that probably came from the Banda Island. Initially. Initially, yeah. Initially. Yeah. So So that's where the story begins in Samarang. And this is the first to migrate to Samarang was Oi Tiong Ham's father, who came from Tong An, which is basic, basically a coastal town in China. He came in 1858, uh, settled in Samarang, married a local girl, uh, had, and then started a trading company called Kianguan which were dealing in teas, Chinese products, teas, silks, herbs, uh, and incense. So this is the Oi family. This picture came from Kenneth. Uh, so they were a traditional, you could see that they were a traditional Chinese family, um, all living under one roof. Tiong Ham, uh, so this is Oichi Tian, the father, the mother. This is Oi Tiong Ham. That's Oi Tiong Ham. Gui Bing Liu. This is the wife, Gui Bing Liu. This is little Hui Lan. And this is Hui Lan's older sister. So Oichi Tian had uh, four daughters, two sons. Uh, and all of them, all the children were married into the Chabang Atas families, which is um, what they call the elite class. And that's the reason why they, they, they tend to marry with, into that elite class. So the Chabang Atas is basically... Um, um, a group of families that, you see, the Dutch East Indies, they had a system called the Kapitan system, where they would select um, leaders from each respective community from this particular pool of families. So if you are not from that family, chances are you will not likely become one of the leaders. And there are advantages of becoming uh, uh, an officer because you get certain privileges like uh, concessions, rights into concessions. So it was very important for, for them to be connected that way. So in Samarang, there are these few families, including uh, Lucy's family, for the whole family, the Goy family, which is uh, Tiong Ham's wife, uh, and of course the Oi family and the B family. So this is an example. This lady has nothing to do with the Oi family, but she's interesting because she is the only, the most celebrated Peranakan woman of her day. She was, uh, she's the only woman that can lay claim to be the granddaughter of a major, which is the highest rank officer, uh, the daughter of a major, the sister of a major, the mother-in-law of a major, the daughter-in-law of a major, the wife of a major. So she's the only one that can lay claim to that. And she is the equivalent to the uh, a female Midas. You know, what, whoever she touches will turn into gold. And uh, the Hawkins call her Kim Ki Ge Hyuk, which means 
a tree made of golden branches and leaves made of jade. So she was, that's how important women are, that they, even though they had no rights, but they could form uh, connections and alliances. Okay, now, the complicated part. Let me get this right. Okay, so, so this is a, a family tree. Oi Kyung Ham was officially married to eight women and officially had 26 children, of which uh, 13... Oh, it's not very clear. Can you see the color? Yeah. Color? Okay. 13 male thir and 13 female. So Hoi Lan comes from the first wife, Bing Liu, Wei Bing Liu, uh, Ida from the fifth wife, and Lucy, the seventh wife. She was the seventh wife. And three, three of these ladies, wife number five, number three, and number two are related. And three of them are from the Chabang Atas family. So the Goe, Wei Bing Liu, uh, Lucy Ho, and the eighth wife, which we don't really know much of. Um, so, so, uh, I think it was Ying Ying and Hang asked me how I'm connected to this family. So I'm going to show you another chart. So this is not a complete uh family tree. Uh, my family tree. So basically, Ida was married to my grandfather, but they were divorced. And then he married several other wives. So it's, <laughs> so I come from the wife, wife number three. So that's Ida. That's, he, she was married to my grandfather. And then we come from this third wife. So we don't really have any blood connection, but we kind of connected anyway. <laughs> okay, so the next slide is what a lot of people often ask me about the beneficiaries who inherited from the will. I mean, it's quite complicated. It took me a while to figure out uh, who got what. So basically, uh, Kyung Han's estate was valued at, I think it was like 50 million straight dollars. But he, he made three wills. Uh, and these were, he only had, he basically gave everything to uh, the sons, except three sons from the third wife, whom he disowned. So, so he gave the bulk of his estate to nine of them, nine boys from three different families, but he also gave to the first wife and the two daughters. Contrary, contrary to what a lot of people thought, Lucy Ho, the seventh wife, did not receive anything and neither, neither did her daughter. So, and, and what he did was, even though they lived in Samarang, he decided to move to Singapore because he did not, he, because Dutch laws did not allow uh, the, 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 did not allow him to basically uh, give away his assets to selected children. You know, he had to, the daughters and the sons were treated equally. So that's one of the reasons why he moved to Singapore so that he could have this will. And the other reason why he moved out of Singapore, uh, Samarang was because he was trying to avoid paying the profit uh, war tax, which was quite a lot. So, okay. Next question, how did he be, make his wealth? Even though he was known as the sugar king, he actually, it was opium that helped him kickstart his career. And it was in 1889 that he made his big break and won the most lucrative opium concession in the whole of the Dutch East Indies, which was in Samarang. That concession was owned by Lucy's grandfather, Ho Yamlo. And upon his death, upon Yamlo's death, Yamlo had given it to the second son. And the second son went into bankruptcy. And in that 
on that year, the uh, the concession came up on auction. So Oi Tiong Ham was only 23, very young, very bold. He was competing with all these very experienced uh, players and he outbidded them, as you can see, by that amount, by almost double. And then from there, he took over the Samarang con uh, concession and then bought, acquired four other farms, made close to 18 million guilders in profit over the past over the next 15 years, which in today's money is equivalent to about 200 over a uh, quarter of a million US dollars. It's quite a lot. So that's how he started and uh, made his big, gave him his big break. So this is a picture. I don't have a fo photo of Ho Yang Lo, but this is basically a, the only photo I have of the whole family. This is Lucy's parents. Lucy's parents. Uh, Lucy's father was the seventh son of Yamlo's eldest son. So it's a bit confusing, but anyway, this, this just to give you an idea of who they were. Okay, this is Oi Tiong Ham. So, so in the 1890s, they uh, when the Dutch government announced that they were going to take over the opium concessions and set up an opium regime. Oi Tiong Ham then diversified from op uh, opium into sugar. He bought over five sugar mills uh, with a total capacity of over 100,000 metric tons that could produce over 100,000 metric tons. And at the peak, at his peak, he was controlling about 60% of the domestic sugar trade, which is why uh, he could build his net worth to um, 200 million guilders or 80 million US dollars. So in terms of ranking, this was what he was his net worth uh, was worth. He was around the same level as uh, the Vanderbilt, Guggenheim, all these people. So it's quite rich by Asian standards. Next slide. Okay, so what, how, what motivated him? So exactly a month ago today, there was another. There's another sugar king, Robert Kwok, who is the current sugar king of Asia. He celebrated his birthday, and um, in his memoirs, he was asked, uh, what was his uh, motivation to succeed, and he recounted that. The what drove him to succeed was the humiliation he received at the hands of the bankers that he wanted to be able to thumb his nose up at them. So that was Robert Kwok's motivation. So what was Oi Tiong Ham's motivation? So his motivation was basically that he hated being labeled a foreign oriental basically being treated as a second-class citizen. So when the Dutch crown took over the Dutch East Indies from uh, uh, the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, they came up with a series of uh, anti-Chinese policies to confine uh, the dominance of the Chinese. So in 1819, there was movement control. They, could, they, could, they had to seek permission to move from one place to another. In 1835, they came up with the zoning, zoning them into camps, into ghettos. They could only live in certain parts of a uh, town. And in 1839, when they introduced taxes, the Chinese had to pay double of what the natives pay, 4% as opposed to 2%. And uh, 1854, when they came up to constitutionally segregate uh, the residents, the Chinese were lumped together with the Indians, Moors and Bengalis as foreign orientals. And this has a big impact on, especially on Oi Tiong Han, because in uh, civil and commercial matters, they were treated, they had to follow native laws. But, uh, so sorry, in civil and criminal, they had to follow native laws. But when it comes to commercial laws, they had to follow European laws. So it was very confusing for the Chinese. 
And then, of course, there was no sub subsidies for the children in terms of their education. And uh, later on, 1870, they introduced uh, dress code laws that they cannot dress. They could only dress in their own native uh, um, attire. So this was one of the reasons. And what did he do? What did Yong Ham do? Oh, yeah, sorry, before that. So there was this thing going on as well during that time, the yellow peril. Um, Sinophobic fears throughout the Western world. And it, was, it, it started during uh, mid-century because of the rise in migration uh, in America. But then it was after the Boxer Rebellion that you know the message was driven through. So, so it, it was very difficult for Chinese people uh, during then. So this is what Kyung Ham did. He sought permission to move out from um, the Chinese camp into the European business district. And there was a reason why, because uh, it was there that they could basically uh, cultivate relationship with lawyers. And one of the most important uh, lawyer that he met Oops, sorry. How do I make? What's this guy called? Uh, C. W. Bon, Baron Bon Hakeran. Bon Hakeran was a young lawyer. Uh, was also a government pro prosecutor, but the family, the Oi family, engaged him to uh, basically uh, um, deal with. He introduced a lot of Western concepts to the Oi family. Like uh, entering into contracts uh, as opposed to doing business through the kinship, the Chinese way. Uh, he also helped them to incorporate the company. So many, many Western um, concepts uh, that he had introduced to, to the family. So th that was the first move in 1888. They moved up from the Chinese camp into the business, uh, European business district. And then the second move in the late uh, 1890s was they moved up, physically moved up from uh, the Chinese camp into the European part of uh, uh, the Dutch uh, Samarang. They bought over the Gaji, which was uh, a home owned by Ho Yam Lo. Ho Yam Lo was the only Chinese allowed to live outside of the Chinese camp. When the, when the fa family business when the family went into bankruptcy, the Oi family bought over the estate, over 200 acres worth of uh, land in this area. And this was uh, Kyung Ham's, uh, be, be, it became Kyung Ham's residence. Then the next step which he did was to basically change uh, his personal uh, appearance. He sought permission to change to to wear Western a Western suit. So of course, you know, that was uh he got permission to do it, but then in at a function, because he had to still wear a Chinese queue, a tail. So he was wearing a suit and at a chi at a function, apparently he was confronted by a Dutchman, a Dutch general, who turned him around and looked at his tail, him wearing a Western suit and asked him, what kind of Chinese are you? you know, so that was the treatment they, that they got. So, but then that was not only it. In 1901, a year after his father's death, he decided to cut off his queue 10 years ahead of time. And he was on his way to Holland to seek permission from the queen uh, to be equated with the Europeans. He wanted, he traveled with his lawyers all the way to Holland to seek permission to be equated with the Europeans. And then of course he was denied. So he went over to sail over to Japan and got Japanese citizenship because the Japanese were treated the same at par with the Europeans. So in that way, he got what he wanted in the end. So then, after going through all that, all this, 
the next thing was to basically show himself off to the rest of the world. So he, in 1902, he went to uh, Paris to participate in this floral parade. Uh, it was the equivalent of a fashion show in Paris at the Bois de Boulogne. And here, and he he got a florist to uh, decorate his four horse carriage with exotic flowers, orchids, lilacs, and he brought six copper tone Javanese young girls to sit with him in the carriage, and they won second prize. This was in nineteen o two, but you know, in today we think that oh, okay, it's not that big a deal, but. Five years after, hang on, let me see if I can click this slide. Five years later, <laughs> Paris held the first human zoo on the other e e uh, side of Paris, the Colonial e Exposition, where they brought in all these natives from Asia, from Africa, and put them together and exhibited them together with animals. So this was, you know, so you can imagine, Pyong Han was so bold to show himself off with a Javanese girl five years ahead of what was happening in, in Europe. That was, you know, that was how bold he was. Okay, so then I'm almost to the end now. This is the bit that I want to talk about. Um, oh yeah, of his children, Hoi Lan, whose uh, English name is uh, uh, Angela, and the sister is Bendelin. What he, in 19, uh, just before her 15th birthday, Yong Ham applied for both daughters to be treated as equals. Um, and so then, eight months later, he threw her a big birthday party when she turned 15 and invited uh, all his business, the children of his European business associates to attend, but no one attended. They snubbed him, the European community snubbed them. So then what he did was a month later, change the surname, oops, sorry, from, Oops, sorry. It, they changed the surname a month later from Oi to Oi Tiong Ham as a guarded reminder of who they were. So this was the thing that you know they had to go through um, during their early years. But Hui Lan did not, she did not bow down to any of the discrimination. She could, you know, she she carried on life without fear, without feeling defeated. And she basically dealt with the racial bias by living a better life, uh, striving. And she showed the world that the East was not so far apart from the West and that being different is not a disadvantage. Uh, and that it could be, it is something to be proud of. And the book tells a lot of uh, what she did, which I don't want to go through today because I don't want to spoil the read for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the end of my presentation. We're going to have our discussion first to dialogue with uh, Book talker, then we open the mic to the uh, audiences. Oh, I have to stop. Thank you so much, Jim, for the kind introduction, and especially thanks to Daryl uh, for the presentation. I cannot sell this book hard enough. Um, to me, reading this was very similar to, I mean, the you know, Tolstoy's War and Peace for straight settlement Chinese. I mean, it is sweeping. It is epic. And it really takes you um, through 
the long 19th century in this, you know, what is uh, the outpost uh, of, of European empire in Southeast Asia, which of course is something near and dear to my heart and Professor Matthew Jones here because we teach Southeast Asian history as well as uh, Professor um, Huang back there. Uh, so you have three Southeast Asianists who have been teaching this to our, uh, to our students here at Columbia. Uh, but it goes beyond that. It goes, you know, as, as you follow um, this amazing multi-generational household uh, to Belle Park, Europe. Um, and there I was blown away with um, with Daryl's description, as you just heard, about, um, you know, these uh, straight Chinese living in Europe and throwing these epic uh, soirees and balls and really navigating uh, the sort of racial tensions that existed in the West. Um, and then all the way to nationalist China and the period of the warlords. Oh, yeah. I was so taken <laughs> with her description of... Uh, how Huilan was able to um, to engage in dog meat general, one yeah, yeah. of the one of the most famous warlords uh, in this period of, of warlord uh, China um, in the 1920s to tea. Can, so you can imagine the six foot six tall warlord having to sit uh, with with Huilan and have, you know, basically a, a very nice uh, afternoon tea with her because he had to, because that was sort of the force uh, of her personality, mm -hmm. despite uh, her being in a very precarious situation at this point uh, when she is in the, the Hotel Peking, all the way, of course, to 20th century America as we as we go through the various sort of uh, uh, protagonist, as you said, the, the 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 one wife and the two daughters, uh, to what it was like then by Cold War America, um, and it's just an amazing, epic, epic, sweeping tale. So I really highly encourage everyone to go to the back after this formal Q and A session is finished and to buy the book and just enjoy it in the way that I did. Um, I have a few questions. I know that I'm the probably the only one because this is literally hot off the the press. Uh, so one of the few who has been able to read it in this room. Um, so I don't want to get into the questions that again like Daryl said to give away uh, a lot of too this, much this away. too yeah. much away you you want to you'll want to read it but just just the highlights and I guess my question is more about um, methodology and practice, mm -hmm. um, process I mean you have this I, I can tell this sort of that you've worked in the banking world and was able to explain this empire um, that um, uh, you know the the sugar king built going from opium uh, to sugar uh, but you also have this you know great uh, historian eye in terms of being able to contextualize their journey mm -hmm. from uh, the, the 19th century uh, to late into the 20th century and be able to explain to us the context of how women, um, the, the limited context in which they were able to operate, why foot binding occurred uh, mm -hmm. up until when it did, when did the, the last women in this household be able to escape that, uh, to something like this sort of uh, racial laws that existed in these European empires, be they Dutch or the British uh, in Southeast Asia. And then, of course, the sort of situation in Europe and then in the United States. But if you could talk a little bit about your process of, of sort of combining both your, you know, your ability to, to navigate and banking and, and that world. And then as this, you know, as, as a historian, because in many ways, this reads very much like a professional historian writing mm -hmm. uh, an amazing family biography. Mm -hmm. So if you could talk about that process of writing. OK, this book. so, I mean. The first book obviously helped a lot because I took about 11 years. I didn't know what I was doing, but basically uh, being a financial ad analyst, uh, what you do is, actually, I didn't know what I was doing with this book. I was basically going through every every possible thing that I could through the archives, the libraries, oral history interviews, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then mapping out, you know, but obviously it's a lot of memory memory work. You 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 basically go through all the information you possibly can, and then you map out uh what each item, like you categorize them, and then you and then I kind of sort of uh 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 link them together, but then at the same time continue to do research. So it might not be the most efficient way because I'm not train as a historian but uh, what I enjoy most is basically research like finding out why did this happen why did that happen you know can I and because I did not engage uh, a research assistant which a lot of people do I was able to then figure out uh, find out a lot of things by myself so then that that is why this book is so full of information because I'm trying to fit everything together uh, 
um, yeah, so it's probably not the most efficient way of doing things, but it's a uh, it's for me it's an enjoyable because I I then get to know, um, you know, more things. So well, th what's fascinating about this is that you write, you know, and I forgot the sort of third hat that you wear, which in many ways you're this you're you're also. Um, so gifted in terms of, of fiction, like you're a novelist writing about it. In many oh, yeah. ways, I wondered where that line between fact, not fact and fiction, but but what the archives, where where the limits were. Okay. So when you were getting into Hui Lan's head or Lucy's or Ida right. and explaining how they felt when, uh, you know, Hui Lan went through the painful divorce right. and being abandoned in London or what Lucy felt having to run this household at such a tender age or Ida when she is having an affair right. uh, and, and having, you know, so, so where did you, were there personal how, memoirs left or right. how did you come uh, to those conclusions oh. and character description? And emotion. Okay, so that I have to thank my publisher because uh, when I first, the first draft read more like an academic book. So they kept on telling me, no, Daryl, if you want the book to sell, you better make it like a story. <laughs> so so I had to take out a lot, like the footnotes, the all the background information um, uh, and try to write it as how my uh the family members who tell the story so that was how so i would have to thank my publisher for reminding me to not write it in an academic way in a very factual way but more more with more you know emotional so you you have to you have to you have to be ruthless and you know you have to like take up a lot of things and just imagine how it would be like the first part on uh the foot binding uh, and how the children, how the dog, how how the little girl uh, went into con concussion, that actually happened to me. Not that my foot is foot bound, but I was uh, electrocuted once when I was a little girl, and uh, I went in. I was unconscious. So from that experience, I could sort of uh, use that to write that little part about how the little girl went into. Uh, yeah, I think she's not giving herself enough credit. It wasn't just the editor pushing her, but you are, you know, very lyrical in the way that you write many of the passages. Now, some of the material lends itself, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you really capture again. And I'm going to go back to Bella Park, Europe, and the and the you know, and, and some of the the images that you saw, the grand parties, mm -hmm. the, the colonial exhibition. And so I wonder, you know, <laughs> I encourage you maybe the next one stray a little bit from the archives and uh -huh. what you're able to footnote and you know sort of use that imagination yeah. even if it's coming from sort of personal or from mm. historical context to describe that world because we've never seen it from the perspective of um of a you know at, at that time whatever they were called the, right. the foreign oriental or from the the perspective yes. of, a, of a wealthy um asian um empire builder right. operating in europe and mm. i just think it was fascinating there's so much there that you can do there to really sort of uh challenge the conventions through this character through these characters that you put and i'm gonna open it up i know you guys may have some questions and if you don't i have so a lot of follow-up questions i can ask uh, of daryl i wanted to go to um to wellington coup uh and to huilan and and the the kind of personal diplomacy that they they carried forward uh, amidst this sort of uh, relationship that they were having. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. And this, I'm, I'm betraying a little bit of my own interest because I am a, a East Asian diplomatic historian and, I, and I've studied this period in terms of the Versailles Conference um, and Wellington Coups. Um, you know, sort of role. And of course, I love teaching it at Columbia because I said how he had written to his Columbia professor talking about having to attend this conference at a young age mm -hmm. and what he wanted to do in terms of Shandong um, and, and you know, sort of state uh, China's uh, position there at the conference. And this whole part that he was actually, you know, this is this is when he was also forming a relationship mm -hmm. with Huilan. It's very similar, of course, everyone knows more of the, what it was happening with Woodrow Wilson at the time, but it's fascinating, mm -hmm. one that we don't know a lot about. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the archives um, mm -hmm. that you, yes. that you, so, you know, yes. went to, to get so, the materials. So that part of the uh, the book, I it, it's, when did I, I contacted you uh, beginning of this year, so it was actually towards the uh, middle of last year that I came across the Wellington Coup archives. And I thought, oh my goodness, why didn't I find out 
about this uh, source earlier because it's basically I was telling Ying Ying is a treasure trove of information. And at that time, I couldn't travel to America because of the lockdowns. So then I was lucky to find, I think some people might have uh, um, uploaded it, uh, the transcripts online. Uh, and that was how I got to, you know, I when I came across um, <clears throat> the transcripts, I was saying, oh my goodness, I could have done so much more. But anyway, uh, yes. So, um, so yes, so it was through that I came across them last year and I went through them very quickly and then again and again and again and found actually you, uh, you could do a search, which is you don't have to read everything. You could do a, a word search and that kind of help. Um, yes, but it's definitely a treasure trove. And I think if I had started with that, it could have been a different book. I think <laughs> I, I think we found your third book topic. <laughs> and I think that that should be the focus of the next one. And that that was just my way of also really encouraging the students in the room to check out the Wellington Koo collection that we have here at Columbia. So, you are it, so lucky. It, it is a pitch to do historical research, uh, so basically. Lucky. And and this is now when I'll open it up to uh, to Q and A from the from the general audience. And I say this because as director of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Uh, going into 2024, we're all about sort of reflection on the past 75 years. 75 is because the Institute has been around for 75 years in 2024. So we're all about sort of reflection backwards and then thinking of the next 75 years. Um, and so in many ways, I loved having this event because one of our new directions uh, is looking at Southeast Asia more closely, but in particular, looking at transnational global Asians of which the OI women uh, are definitely a part of. So with that, I'm going to open it up again. We know that you haven't read it, but any questions? This is so special to have the author with us in this amazing sweeping tale. Yes, one thing I want to uh, remind people: we still have another big groups uh, uh, online. We have 41 audiences online watching these lectures and have questions. So uh, take a chance to answer the, ask the questions, and I will balance the you know both sides uh, questions. Uh, one thing is uh, two books, uh, Miss. Yep, already donated to the library. We will process them, rush order. So any student can check them out, uh, can read them, you know, just for your information. That's the head of the CV Star Library, uh -huh. so you know it will happen. <laughs> so we have a, one question first. Hello. Oh. So that's the audience. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, and so uh, my question is also about archives. Mm -hmm. And because it's such a personal story that you're putting forth, I was wondering to kind of what the balance was like when it comes to like uh, public or like institutional archives versus how much you had to go through private archives and like look for private family documents and how navigating that right. looked like. Thank you. So are you referring to the first book or the second book? Okay, the second book. Second book, it, you know, as I said, finding information about women it's not easy. Uh, well, for the fact that, you know, there's so little written about them. And that was one of the reasons why I uh, decided to do the book, but also to include three women, because I wasn't sure whether I would have enough to just write about one. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Hoi Lan, I didn't really have a problem because uh, she had herself written two biographies. Uh, and then, of course, she appeared in a lot of the uh, newspapers and and um, also the Wellington Koo archives as well. Uh, Ida of the the other two, Ida, I had the most problem with because basically there was hardly anything. So it's basic uh, hearsays from family members, uh, stories recounted from people who knew her in Penang. Uh, but her story is actually, you know, I was half. I wa wasn't sure whether I would include her in I almost wanted to take her out from the the book but my publisher after reading it through said no Daryl you have to keep her because she's really interesting I mean she did a lot of things that gave my grandfather a lot of grief so you know <laughs> keep her in the book yeah <laughs> Oh, sorry. Sorry. A uh, quick follow-up question is, how did you decide on these three women? Okay, so uh, Lucy was because I met 
the daughter, the last living uh, daughter of Oi Tiong Ham. I met her in um, Bangkok. She was living there. And it was through discussion with the family that they actually wanted me to write about Oi Tiong Ham. But, you know, after spending 11 years writing about men, I didn't want to do another book about men. <laughs> so then I said, okay, let me try writing about the women. So then we decided Lucy, but then... I wasn't sure if I had enough on her. Then I went, then we said, of course, we have to have uh, uh, Madam Wellington Koo because she's the most celebrated daughter. And and then I thought, okay, Ida could fit in because she was from a different generation, the Plata age, which was also very interesting. So that was how the three were chosen. It, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to try to pick up a wind of the online questions. Uh, so questions from the O Ting E. So maybe the O Wei family. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So how did uh, this woman navigate the Chinese identities with their adopted European roles? How did they navigate their Chinese identities? Yes, with oh. their Euro adopted the European I, roles. Oh, I think they were very comfortable. I think they were very comfortable to 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 basically have both. You know, uh, Ed Lucy. Lucy, I think I have never met her, but her family was extremely European. I mean, they speak, they speak with a Dutch accent, so they were very European. Uh, but Ida was very, very comfortable being both Asian as well as being very Ida uh, had a European lover. You know, she was comfortable mm. in both. And I think with Madam Wellington Koo too, I think they she was very comfortable with both. In fact, I think she grew up with a European background, but then towards uh, when she was in China, she had suddenly, you know, changed European dresses back to wearing Cheong Sams, wearing to Chinese dresses and showing off the Chinese culture. So she was comfortable having both uh uh, cultures. Thank you. Uh, one more question online is uh, was your use of the yellow peril as a term of um, phrase used during the historical time of your lecture or your present day current reference? Uh, the use of yellow sorry. peril. You, you, when during a lecture you yes. use the yellow peril. Yes. Is that term used the historical terms or yes. current? historical term because I was referring to that period when they were growing up that the yellow that was when the yellow peril um uh yeah Quit. came about yes are um, questions here Uh, hi, Daryl. My name is Kaluni Man, and I'm also from Penang. Oh, so it's always fun to meet another Penang guy here. <laughs> My question to you is about Mrs. Wellington or Madam Wellington, who uh, you mentioned that she was quite a fascinating character. Without giving too much away, can you give one example of why she was so fascinating? And okay. that, we, what should I tell about your grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. Okay, I've got one. I think okay. you can relate to this one. Okay. So after her 15th birthday, they the, the family, the father took them to Europe on a tour and then they came back. They spent a couple of months in Singapore where she met uh, this very famous Belgian soprano who gave them music lessons. So this was in 1905 or 1906. Uh, and then they decided, oh, okay, uh, to the sister and herself, Poilan, they then uh, they hosted uh, a soir a, a musical, a performance, an opera. And they had all these European children with two Chinese children, uh, girl, performing. This is nineteen oh five, performing French opera to an English audience. So. You know, in so of course, you know when that when they came out on stage, Hui Lan was the star of the show. When they came out on stage, everyone was just so amazed that this Chinese girl could speak uh, sing French to a completely English audience. The next day, the newspaper hailed it as the world's first. But 
the following year in Samarang, they tried to do the same. Uh, but then they had a completely different reaction from the Dutch audience. So, you know, this was a thing that she had to go through when she was a young girl. Always coming up with, you know, doing bold things like coming up on stage, singing uh, opera. Uh, or in 1919, she was the first to fly a Chinese woman flying a plane just after World War I. I mean, one of the first, even before Amelia Earhart. Mm -hmm. So you have to think, you know, you have to put everything in context to see how amazing, you know, she was so bold to do all these things. But I think her greatest contribution is probably helping the husband. Because, would you agree? <laughs> yeah. Because without her, I think his career, I think his career would probably not be the same. That's the granddaughter you can ask her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, so in 1889, why would the Dutch have allowed the opium franchise that they controlled to be purchased by uh, rights to participate in by, by people like Wu Chang Ham so he could rise in power? Right. Why would the Dutch have allowed that? Oh, because that's how they started the opium concession, because it was a way to, uh, it cost money to, uh, you know, it's like the Capitan system. The reason why they did not, they appointed local community leaders to basically manage a community is because it's a way, it's an efficient way of managing a colony. They had very, very few civil servants living in the Dutch East Indies. And so uh, to basically uh, um, reward them, they would give away the concession because it's not easy to, you have to manufacture, then distribute and to control. And it, they, you had to bid. It's not as though it was for free. You had to bid, pay a price to win the right to the concession. So th the Dutch derived a lot of revenues from just auctioning it out. So in that was in 1889. Is, is that what you... Yes, that's my But question. then they took control back oh, in the okay. 1890s because they wanted to control... Uh, yeah, they took they introduced the regi, the opium regi, where they centralized the system, took back control, uh, produced and distributed themselves. So with this one here, then the next one back there. Uh, hi everyone, Hello. thank you so much. I really enjoyed your lecture. Um I wonder, um, given like the fluidity between like the way in which they associate they were associated with um Chinese and European societies, mm -hmm. I wonder what like the legacy of that is today and like the impact that that's had like in like our current world and mm -hmm. you know. So the legacy are people like us. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's the legacy. I mean, that's why we are Definitely, called. Like, yeah. We have Western names. We yeah. can't really speak Chinese. Very valid. <laughs> <laughs> no 100% yeah. yeah 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 I mean we, when we go back to China we feel almost like a foreigner I mean I we feel probably not not you so much because we we don't speak we speak uh, a dialect called Hokkien mm -hmm. but it's been bastardized it's been mixed with the local languages so when we speak Hokkien to mm -hmm. the Chinese in China they would not understand us. They have very a lot a lot of difficulty understanding wow. the way we uh, yeah pronounce certain words and or we use a lot of uh, local words in our our dialect as well. So I guess that's that's they that paved the way. Yeah, you know, paved yeah. the way. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. That's really yeah. cool. To hear. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, behind oh, you. Mom. It's just a follow up, really. It's okay. um because I wonder. There's obviously so much privilege and so much um, ability to tr traverse these two worlds and to live in a European quarter and to mm -hmm. win the franchise which takes mm -hmm. money and resource but I'm just wondering you know how exceptional is this ability to code switch if you haven't got that um, privilege yeah. and that resource yeah. that financial yeah. resource sure I mean yes money had a lot to do with it of course 
definitely. Mm. But then you also needed the willpower to change, isn't it? Because you can see it wasn't easy. <laughs> when they changed, they were ridiculed, they were humiliated, mm. but then that didn't sort of put set them back. Mm. So it, there was a, also a lot of willpower, I think. But I, want I, mean, to, I just wonder about the people who were maybe living still in the in the Chinese quarter who weren't able to make it out. You know, like what 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 kind of ability do those people? It's not just about willpower. Are they able to code switch and get into different parts of society? Yeah, I, I mean, know that's beyond your scope in a sense. Yeah, yeah. But... No, I think uh, you know they did. They did actually. We have a few in. You could ask Kenneth's mom. She was from Indonesia, and she came up. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, in the thirties, I, well, I, I was a child of nine when the Japanese entered Indonesia. It's in 1941, but until that time, my family was Western educated, like most many of their of their acquaintances and friends, and we lived in that Chandi area. Mm -hmm. You know uh -huh. that right. uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Um, I always went to Dutch schools. Uh, I was in fourth grade when. The schools, of course, closed, and the Dutch were interned. So I lived uh, during the occupation. You know, everybody on that hill moved down to the town where it was safer to live. You know, because there was nobody left up up there on that on that nice hill where it was cooler. But they relaxed a, nice... a lot of the, they relaxed. I think they relaxed a lot of the law later on. So that kind of, you know, yeah. So, but when they were growing up, it was that, that, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> anyway, and I'm the first of his wives, or the first wife, actually, Mrs. Wu jong Hong. Uh -huh. Her name was Gui Bing Niu. Yeah. She is my great, uh, great, great aunt. aunt. Uh -huh. oh, she right, is the yes. sister of my... Yeah. Great grandfather. Yeah. Wu Chang Hong is my great uncle on my father's side. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of family connection. <laughs> I met Kenneth. I, I met Kenneth so about last week. A gui <laughs> and a bay and an ui in our yes, family. That's right. <laughs> All the Chabang Atas families. Thank you so much. I'm uh, uh, Chen Zhi Wang, uh, uh -huh. Chinese librarian. Uh, again, this is a follow up question to you. Uh, the question three people I had, uh, may we here today hear Yin Yin, the granddaughter of uh, uh, Huang Huinan. What most significant about Huang Huinan do you think, if you don't mind? Ha <laughs> uh -huh, yeah, that's a good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, uh, I think, well, first of all, I have to say that Daryl's book is very interesting. I second your opinion that you should rush over there and buy it. And it was specially negotiated for an American price because it was too expensive in the beginning. <laughs> Singapore thinks they have more money in the United States than they do. But um, so I, I would definitely encourage you that. And the other thing I would say is it's very interesting. What I found was also interesting is the economics brought into this discussion. Not as we think about it now in terms of capitalism and terms of as you mentioned, privilege and elitism. This was not the issue. The issue, as you describe it, which is very interesting, is a means of, first of all, creativity and entrepreneurship, before we get to the concept of privilege, thank you so much, but also that we think now we're a global society. There was a global society two generations back. Okay. Just like today, many people do not participate in the global society. Many people throughout the world are not part directly of the global society. In those days, it was true too. Maybe a certain segment, but that segment also interacted, like Daryl was mentioned, interacting, and as Mrs. Bay mentioned, interacted with the society 
in a way which I'm not so sure we do as well now. Globally, I think we carry our own identity much stronger and are more resistant to adapt to other cultures, especially in this country because we are the greatest country in the world. So we don't need to adapt as much. But in those days that I believe there was more mutuality of um, intersection of ideas because to the West it was exotic and to the East it was a means of really expanding influence and contact. But that wasn't your question, Jimwe. My grandmother, I will have to say, um, in the book, I will have to say, shows one slice of her life. This was a formidable person. She wrote two autobiographies of herself. One was banned and was removed from the press by my grandfather because it was too explicit. Um, you can still buy copies of it on the internet, rarely, but you can. The second, the second one was written um, when she was already in her 70s or 80s, dictated and written with the help of somebody. And it was remarkable because she talks about her childhood all the way up to her current life in Manhattan. And she was a person, I was trying to think about this earlier with Daryl. I would just say one thing. If you ever see her handwriting, it was very, she wrote in English and many languages, but very open, very expressive, and very bold. There was none of this little, little letters like this. There was none of this, you can't decipher what she was writing. You could read every word and it was very precise. This was a person confident of herself, experienced and creative. I think that if she were alive today, we were talking about this at yeah. lunch, Daryl and I, yeah. that um, if she hadn't become the wife of my grandfather, um, she could have been a major business magnet. Just that personality, the interest, the vivation, the energy, that kind of person. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of person. But in helping my grandfather, there's another role, um, which I, I think relates to the question about how, um, if you have one nationality, how do you relate with others? This was a person um, who could take on many colors. You know, there are people like that, right? There were many Chinese women who were wives of diplomats of my grandfather's generation who could not do that. They were very Chinese. They, they lived a very Chinese life. They were in the household, strong people, innovative people, but not comfortable mixing. My grandmother would have, you know, French, German, Spanish. She could speak all those languages at the embassy and socialize easily. Many of us cannot do that ourselves. We cannot socialize with people who speak, but don't speak English or people who have never been in the United States and carry on a conversation. This was a person who could do that. So she was a great entertainer. She was well known for that, but she was also very patriotic. So would raise money during the war for China, would go on speeches herself, confident. So in a way, and I would think you're right in terms of an international woman. This is how we remember her at least. Okay, uh, I have another online question to ask uh, Daryl. Were this book available in China? If so, uh, what do you think of your audience would be older Chinese or younger Chinese people? Um, I think probably younger Chinese people. I mean, that's what, we are trying to uh, target. That's a target market that we are looking at. So you are uh, negotiating the uh, Chinese version, translation version with Chinese publishers. Uh, the publisher is. Great. Okay. Yep. Historical crazy rich Asians. No, <laughs> no, don't say that. That's a very next one. Yeah, another movie. <laughs> a bit, could be a good movie. <laughs> Yes, any other questions online here? Yes, okay, let me see if there's anything online here. No, 
No, I think you have, sorry. I just wanted to add to your point that you have to look at things from, you know, take it at a, you need to look at things from a context. Right now, when we, when we talk about all these things that she did, it might sound, mm, okay, no big deal. But actually, when you go back to that time, it was a huge deal. Like, a, you know, like, for instance, the floral parade in Paris. I mean, that was a big thing. That was so bold for him to do that when oh, five years later, you know, they, they had uh, that kind of exhibition. So it's huge. They were, they, it may not sound big a deal now, but back then it was huge. And just follow on the sure. your research. Yes. Um, there was a uh, seminar here that uh -huh. most of the research dissertation is somewhere nobody could access. Right. So the conclusion of that seminar a few years ago was that you have to have at least three version, a academic rigorous base, mm -hmm. then something like yours, mm -hmm. and another through Facebook, mm -hmm. or you could read through the phone. Right. So I would like to see that research done, you know, has a, I mean, all the work that you put in. Mm -hmm. uh, put it I, online? Well, well, come up with a dissertation or something. Oh, oh, with okay. With the new edition of uh, <laughs> Archive. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Um, off the back of that, I wonder yeah. are you going to write any, another book? Or how are you... Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, mm, yeah, I would definitely want to write another book, but I have to find... Uh, uh, the right topic. You know, I was just telling Ying Ying that how I wish I could read Chinese, read and speak Chinese because there is so much information available at the archives, at the library here. I mean, it's just, I was, so please, can I, can it get translated, please? <laughs> so much information. And, and that is basically, that helps a lot, you know, because I was, when I did my first book, I was traveling all over to Singapore, and they didn't digitize the newspapers back then. So you, I'd have to sit in the library looking through the microfiche, one reel after the other. So it was it was a lot of work. So now you have everything in one in, in one repository, which is like amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think we're going to end our uh, the lecture parts right now. And I want to thank all the sponsors for this event. First, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and the CV Star East Asian Library and the New York Southeast Asian Networks. And now we're going to save some time for our author to sign the books okay. right behind Thank there. You. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you for coming. No, one more thing. You know the nutmeg? You have to crack the shell first before you use it. So I hope you don't know, shave it over your eggnog. Well, yeah. <laughs> the nut is inside. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>